Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Kenwood Heights Christian Church this morning. My name is Alex, and I serve on staff as youth minister at our church, and I want to welcome you here today and tell you that we are so glad that you are here. We are so thankful for another day that we can come together as a church family and worship in the name of the Lord. Today, we've got a great day planned for you, uh, and here in just a few moments, I'm going to pass this off to our friend Peyton Baskins, who's going to lead us in worship, and soon after that, Randy's going to come on, and he's going to share a message with us. But just real quick here this morning, as we get started today, I want to give you a couple of announcements, a couple of reminders about some things that we are doing. Doing, and then I'll pray for us and we will continue on in our service together today. Uh, for one, I just want to remind you as we do each week that we are at the church building today for drive through communion offering and prayer. We will be there until one o'clock today. And so we'd love for you to feel free to come on by if you'd like today after service to partake in communion offering or prayer. Uh, we'll be there until one. We'd love to have you come and join us for that. I also want to encourage you once more to go and check out our website, kimwoodheights.com, and in particular, check out our online page on our website, uh, see some of the resources that we have available to you uh, and have available for all ages on there as well. So we encourage you to go check out our website, kimwoodheights.com, and in particular, our online page. I also want to remind you as well to feel free to please share our video with your friends and your family and your loved ones around you, uh, whether that is through Facebook or from our website and our YouTube channel, whatever it might be. Uh, we'd love to have as many people people uh, come and join us as we can uh, and we encourage you as well to also feel free to engage with us uh, in the comments as well let us know that you're here let us know what you think uh, we'd love to be able to communicate back and forth with you our church family uh, we are so excited to have you join us today and to be able to engage with you and interact with you i also want to encourage you as well as always to feel free to let us know how we can pray for you how can we encourage you and how can we be there for you right now as well my last announcement for you just real quick is one that we announced last week during our mother's Day service. Uh, last week on Mother's Day, we announced our partnership with ALC, which stands for A Loving Choice. And so what we are going to do is we are going to join in with ALC's mission to collect uh, from Mother's Day up to Father's Day donations for their ministry. Normally, you might have seen us before do the baby bottle campaign. And so we are going to uh, join ALC for a virtual baby bottle campaign, if you will. And here's how you can donate to that if you would like. Uh, for one, you can donate online today at alckentucky.com slash support dash us again that is alckentucky.com slash support dash us you can also text the amount that you want to donate to 502-443-1288 502-443-1288 or you can also mail your donation in at p.o box 1575 shelbyville kentucky 40066. Again, that is P.O. Box 1575, Shelbyville, Kentucky, 40066. So this is just a partnership that we are joining ALC in. We are so excited for their ministry and for the way that God is using their ministry to impact our community, and we're so thankful to partner with them in that. Church family, we're so glad that you have joined us today for worship. If you will, let me pray for us, and we will continue on in our service together today. Father God, I thank you just for this morning. I thank you, God, just for the worship and the time to come together as a church. God, thank you for the blessing that we find in your son, Jesus. God, thank you for the hope that you give to us each and every single day. Father, thank you that today we can come and we can cast everything else aside and focus our attention onto you. God, thank you for the work that you do in our lives. Thank you for the work that you do in our church. God, thank you that in all things, we know that your love for us is real and your love for us is greater than everything else. Father, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, let me encourage you once more. Feel free to share our video with those around you. We are so glad that you have joined us today, and we look forward to our time of worship together. Feel free to reach out to us for anything we can do, but let's worship together today as a church family. The Apostle Paul writes this in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. He says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of my surpassing great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three days I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I don't know what the thorn in your flesh is. It might be anxiety brought about by being at home for so long. Or maybe you're just worried about being laid off at work. Again, I don't know what that is for you, but I do know one thing. The grace of God is sufficient for all things. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for this time where we can just come together and lift up your name. God, I ask that you'll just be with us and let us know that no matter what we're going through, whether it be trial or temptation, that you're there with us. 
let us know that it's okay to worry, just as long as we turn our eyes back to you. And through it all, let us sing, It is well with our soul. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Reaching out to welcome you, God. Fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Give us the greater glimpse of a never changing God. All we want and all we need is found in you, it's found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you, it's found in you. Open wide our hearts now to yours. Every fear is bowed down to your love. That we would sing like never before. Give us the greater glimpse of a never changing God. All we and all we need is found in you, it's found in you, Jesus, every victory, it's found in you, it's found in you. In your presence there is freedom. Presence, we are made whole. In your presence, there is freedom. In your presence, we are made whole. And all we want and all we need is found in you, it's found in you. Jesus, every victory is found in you, it's found in you, and all we want and all we need is found in you, it's found in you, Jesus, every victory is found in you, it's found in you, whoa, whoa. But the whole 
is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul O Lord haste the day when my faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul Hi, it's great to be sharing together today and worship with you. Uh, if you do have a Bible, um, you're welcome to open that now to Philippians chapter 4. And uh, I know it'll be on the screen as well, the various scriptures that we use today. But if you'd like to have one open, just want to encourage you with that today. Are you a contented person? For instance, are you content with your job? A recent Monster.com survey said that 53% of the American people are currently unhappy with the job that they have. Are you content with your marriage? Would you say that you are content 90% of the time or 70% of the time or you're not content at all? Are you content with your body? When you get up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, do you say, thank you, God, for making me just like this? Or do you look at yourself and sigh and go have a waffle with lots of syrup on it? Are you content with your salary? Or are you always wanting more? In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul made a very remarkable statement. He wrote, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. When a person says, I have learned the secret of being content, we should sit up and take notice, especially when we consider that the man writing these words was single, broke, was in prison, was in poor health, and was an older man. And yet he says, I have learned to be content. Today I want to look at a couple of things today in this message. First of all, why are we so discontented? And secondly, how can we develop a consistent spirit of satisfaction in our lives? First of all, there are several things in our lives that battle against contentment. Let's look at a few of them today. First of all, we battle against unrealistic expectations. If your expect expectation level is too high, it's difficult for you ever to be content with what you have or where you are. For instance, if you are a UK football fan, 
you are happy during the season if you beat Louisville and you get to a bowl game. But if you're a UK basketball fan and they don't make it to the Final Four at least, you're probably disappointed with the season and wish that Coach Cal could have developed the players a little bit more. You see, so much of it has to do with our level of expectation. Many of us were raised by parents who were overprotective. They were determined to protect us from every disappointment that they could. And so they responded to our almost to our every desire, seldom demanding much sacrifice from us, running interference for us at school if problems came up. And we grew up with this impression that life is supposed to be nearly perfect and whatever isn't, somebody is going to go to bat for us and make things right. And we have been falsely programmed so often with this naive concept about life and these unrealistic expectations so often lead to disillusionment. We get out on our own and we come face to face with life's realities and we aren't really prepared to handle them very well. For instance, you got married with high hopes and later discovered that your husband is very self-centered or your wife gains a lot of weight and you become disillusioned with marriage as a whole. Or you took a job with high hopes and at first you really enjoyed your work, but then so much of your work became tedious over time and your co-workers don't share your, your values, you don't have much in common, and you hate to go to work now. Or you become a Christian and you've discovered that you still struggle with temptations and you still have problems, and you feel like God has let you down. That's why Jesus taught his followers to be very realistic about life and what it had in store. Jesus very plainly taught in the Sermon on the Mount that each day is going to have trouble. In fact, he said in Matthew 6.34, each day has enough trouble of its own. If you expect trouble, you're not disillusioned when it comes. You learn to appreciate the, the carefree days as a great blessing, and you deal with the difficulties as a part of life. When Paul was called into Christ's ministry, Jesus made sure that Paul understood how much he would suffer in the name of Christ. And so Paul wasn't shocked by prison. He expected it. And many of the other horrible things that happened to him as he served Jesus Christ. So we battle unrealistic expectations but in discontentment, we also battle against unfair comparisons. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus told the parable about a vineyard who went out at dawn and hired a group of laborers to work all day, and he agreed to pay them a denarius at the end of the day, which is about an average day's wage in that particular time. At nine o'clock, the owner of the vineyard realized that he was going to be short-handed for what needed to be done that day, and so he went out and brought another group in and agreed to pay them a denarius for working the rest of the day. He hired another group at noon, another group at three o'clock, and agreed that, uh, paid to, to pay them the same amount, but at five o'clock in the afternoon, he hired another group to work just an hour and he also paid them a denarius. Now the guys who'd worked 12 hours that day and only got a denarius were pretty ticked off. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 11, we read, When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. 
These men who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Unfair comparisons always lead to envy. You're not discontented because you have so little. You're discontented because someone else has more than you. You remember the wicked queen in Snow White? She was content as long as she was the prettiest woman in the land. But when she became the second prettiest woman in the land, she was so angry that she was bent on destroying the competition. You can make your life absolutely miserable by comparing anything you have with what somebody else has. Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Paul didn't compare himself to others who were free and not in prison and feel deprived. Instead, he compared himself to Jesus hanging on the cross for his sins, and he felt honored to suffer in the name of Jesus. To have contentment, we also battle against unnoticed blessings. Probably no group in history has had more possessions, more freedom, more recreational opportunities than we have. But we don't notice them because they've all become so common. So common that we consider them necessities so much of the time. For instance, is air conditioning a necessity? Or a luxury. You know, we say, well, if you live in the humid Ohio Valley, air conditioning is a necessity. And most of us would probably agree with that. I remember when we were growing up and in our car, Dad would often say that we had 460 air conditioning. That was all four windows open and the car going 60 miles per hour. We see air conditioning today, though, as a necessity. But 40 years ago, people didn't have it, and they got by. But we don't even think about it unless it goes out, and then we complain. As long as it's pumping out that cold air, we don't even notice it. We expect it. It's just a part of life. But if it's missing, if it's gone, then all of a sudden we complain. Is an indoor toilet a necessity, or a luxury. Seventy-five years ago, it wasn't a necessity. But when was the last time that you went into the bathroom and thought, Dear God, I thank you that I have an indoor toilet. We are so blessed by that, but we never even think about it. We probably never thank God about uh, for it unless the sewer blocks up. And then we've got a problem. What about an automobile? Most of us think we have to have two of those. Or how about a television? Or how about a a cell phone, a smartphone, that so many of us have grown so dependent on? Is it a necessity? Or is it a luxury? Our failure to even notice our blessings leads to complaining about things we don't have. We don't just appreciate what we have, we just complain about the things we don't have. 
Paul states a biblical principle of commitment, I mean of contentment, that is lost on so many of us. Paul told Timothy, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. A basic biblical principle of contentment. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. You know, we've moved so far beyond just being content with just food and clothing. You know, the famous painting, the Mona Lisa, hung in a museum in Paris from 1899 to 1911. Then in 1912, somebody stole it, and it was gone from the museum for two whole years. During the two-year period when it was gone, there were more people who came through the museum to stare at the blank space on the wall where it had once hung than in the previous 12 years combined. And you know why. We don't appreciate what we have until it's gone. Unnoticed blessings lead to complaining. But another thing that robs us of contentment is uncontrolled ambition. Ambition is very healthy as long as it is under control. Contentment is certainly not laziness. It is not just watching the world go by while we twiddle our thumbs and sit idly by. The Bible teaches ambition is good. Jesus commended the five-talent man for working and doubling his investment. The Bible says in Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Ambition to do things for Jesus is good. So a Christian should strive for excellence, but also make good use of the gifts that God has given to us. This ambition is good. But when ambition is fueled by ego, me looking good, me looking superior, praise me, then it's out of control. And it leads to restlessness. James 3.16 says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Well, those are some things that we battle that bring discontentment. But what are the, what are the things that Paul mentions here that are true secrets of com- contentment? Well, first of all, contentment comes with an attitude of gratitude regardless of the circumstances. Paul said in verse 11, For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. In our minds, we think we would be more content if our situation were improved, if my job was more fulfilling, if if I were only out of debt, if my husband were only more affectionate, if I were only healthy again, then I would be content. But in reality, your peace of mind is about 10% circumstances and 90% about your attitude. Our happiness, you see, is a personal choice. It's not just a lucky break that some happen upon and some don't. It's how we choose to look at what we have and and find that sufficient. I'd heard a story about a South Vietnamese officer who was imprisoned by this, the Viet Cong for several years during the Vietnam War. After his release, he wrote a book entitled The Vietnamese Gulag. He talked about how in prison, satisfaction for him kept changing over the passing of time. I want you to listen to a little bit of what he wrote. 
He said, when you're first in prison, you shout and maintain your innocence. You demand an apology. You scream that they should let you out immediately. Time passes. Second stage. Freedom will only be if they go ahead and punish me and kick me in the pants hard and release me. I'll take that. Time passes. You're still there. Third stage. You only have sandy rice to eat now, and you think happiness would be a little bit of meat or a little bit of sugar. Time passes, and you're still alone. Fourth stage. Forget the meat and the sugar. Just give me someone to talk to. Fifth stage. I'm chained in prison in isolation. Joy would be if I had my hands free and my legs unshackled so I could straighten up and walk even three paces. He said he reached the point where ecstasy for him came on that day that he was given a clean cotton t-shirt and a new pair of shorts. So much of contentment has to do with attitude and expectations. Can you imagine how delighted a person in prison camp would be if they could sit exactly where you are sitting today? If you are a grumbling, complaining person, do you want to stay that way? Jesus asked the man who needed healing in, in John 5, do you, do you want to get well? And the question for a lot of us, if we're discontented, if we're a grumbling person and a negative person and, and can't see the good in anything, do, do we want to get well? Do we want to be different? And if we want to be different, we have to make that decision. And there are things that, that God has provided to help us if, if we struggle with contentment. For instance, you can ask someone to help you. You maybe have someone in your family, a, a spouse or um, someone else that you're close to, a friend. You can simply say, hey, you know, I've got a real issue with, with uh, grumbling and negativity. And they're probably thinking in their mind, yes, you do. And, and you ask them, you say, you know, I want to change as I need the Lord's help. But I, I'm really asking for you to be helpful to me as well. So when you hear me complaining and starting off on some whining, would you just stop me and say, I thought you wanted to be different. I thought you wanted to change this. If so, this would be a good time to stop. Ask someone to help you. But also begin each day in prayer, in a positive prayer, thanking God for what he has already given to you. And we've talked before in this book about being very specific about what those things are, listing them very specifically, and how significant that can be in changing our perspective. And so asking someone to help, turning to God and beginning a positive prayer and ask Him for help are, are two wonderful things that we can do if we want to change this. Because I know this is a lot about attitude, and I say that because I have been on both sides of that fence. And if you want to be content, it's important to develop an attitude of gratitude regardless of the circumstances. Also, in contentment, a big part of finding that is realizing that you can do more than you, can, you think if the Lord is your strength. Paul said in uh, verse 12 and 13, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. 
you can find contentment in any and every situation when you look to the Lord for the strength that you need. Everything God has commanded, you can do in His strength. And He can give you the strength to find contentment regardless of what you're facing. A third key to contentment that Paul shares here is to love people, not things. Value your relationships with people more than your achievements. Look at verse 10. He said, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. You see, even though Paul was in prison, he was uplifted to know that the people in Philippi had been trying to contact him. They hadn't been able to do so for some time, maybe because Paul wasn't available. But he now receives their expression of concern for him with great delight. Let's move down to verse 14. He said, Even so you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to realize a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul is wanting them to know he's not writing to soak more from them or to receive more from them. He's got everything he needs. He is content in his situation. They have blessed him so much. God has blessed him so much. He is just simply saying, thanks for your care. He didn't complain here about being in prison. He's just uplifted by the fact that people care for him. Do you have people that care about you? And do you have people in your life that you really, really love? If you do, like Paul, take delight in that knowledge. Quit taking them for granted. And when, especially when they're the most important thing in your life, but so often we get sidetracked on other diversions that take us away from expressing to people what, how much they mean to us and enjoying those relationships. Express that love. Expand those relationships with generosity and kindness and attention. Because when all is said and done, all the things you've accomplished are not going to matter to a hill of beans. It's your relationship to God and your relationships with other people, it's really going to matter. And when you focus on those relationships, then contentment comes as a byproduct in knowing that you love and are loved. There's one additional enemy to contentment that I didn't mention earlier, and that is unforgiven sin. If you are burdened by past mistakes and those things often lead to guilt and self-degradation and the loss of your purpose in life. And if you are a, a non-Christian, the important thing for you would be to respond to the call of Christ to receive Him as your personal Savior. And if that would be your situation, I'd certainly love to speak to you about that. But if you are a Christian... It's important that you understand what God wants you to do is confess your sin, ask for forgiveness, and then trust the forgiveness that He has promised you through His grace. And to learn to live in that reality instead of continually mulling over and stewing in things that you did in your past. Jesus has brought new purpose and direction into your life, and that is, should be much more important now 
than things that we have done that we've regretted. Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive our sins and he has promised that if we'll confess him publicly and dedicate our lives to him and be baptized into him, then the sins of the past are washed away and our future has new direction and hope. Paul wrote in verse 19, And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from His glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. He alone is sufficient in any and all things to meet your needs. Would you pray with me today? Thank you, Lord. Father, we are so blessed to live in Jesus Christ to realize we have more power than we often realize. Power to follow you, power to attach ourselves to the things you have promised to us, but also the power with the minds that you have given us to make decisions, decisions that affect the outlook of our lives and how we see ourselves, our possessions, other people in our lives. And we just pray today to refocus and reprioritize things in our life and their value of importance. And may they honor you in the greatest way. We just thank you, Father, for bringing true contentment to our lives. And we just pray to find that, that we might bring greater glory to you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I'll be looking forward to sharing a midweek thought with you coming up Wednesday, Lord willing. And I continue to pray for you as we move forward through this time together.